Lesson one, don't flood the house with a foamer. This was when they were starting to do the foaming initially, and they had a leak, and they let it go, and next thing you know, we have turkey soup. So that was just a very nasty mess to deal with. Um, and this is during the outbreak when, when we were all overwhelmed. We didn't have the equipment, the, the laborers, et cetera. You start seeing decomposition. You start attracting flies, and those are maggots, actually, that uh, have formed. So if you don't follow my recommendation on, on getting the carcasses covered up quickly, you're going to probably need a fly control plan. And this is what happens in the warm months if those carcasses are left out. It's a pretty nasty sight, but I show you this to encourage you to get these carcasses covered within days, especially in our warmer climates. And if even if the carcasses go in there with just eggs in them, it could create some challenges where the larvae are actually coming out of the pile. And you see a river of larvae coming down the pile. It looked like my piles were actually melting. And now I have not only an issue with a bunch of dead birds, but I've got a, a fly issue. I had to start spraying these with permethrin. 3% permethrin just ticks off maggots. 5% uh, will actually kill them. Had to learn that the hard way. Have the right equipment. Um, for layer operations, small skid steer, turkey operations, track loaders, uh, payloaders work great for moving equipment. Choose wisely on uh, who's going to be doing the labor. I've worked well uh, with producers that got in there and, uh, and did it. They just don't need to get distracted. Uh, they can easily get overwhelmed with indemnity payments. And uh, if they can get in there and devote 12 to 15 hours a day on a skid steer, it can work. Uh, if they're not able to, you need to look at contractors or USDA staff. Um, if using bio bags, have somewhere to dispose of them. That's what happened in, uh, in Iowa. And uh, they thought that they could send them to a landfill. The landfills changed their minds. And next thing you have these, these bio bags that are expanding with all the gas and chickens shooting a quarter of a mile across a cornfield. Buyer beware. This is Dr. Richard Austin. I think I saw him on here. He looks like he's karate chopping this log. Um, some carbon suppliers just see dollar signs, and they will send you this junk. So quality control is so important. Uh, you have to be checking what you're getting and turning it back if it's not suitable. I learned this from Bud Malone. When you unload this material, unload it at the end of the barn so you're making less trips. Uh, and, and you're using your time more efficiently. If you can get a walking floor trailer, that's even better to go in that house and unload this material. Equally distribute carcasses. This is what happens when they try to pile too many carcasses in one area. You get leachate. So uh, what we do in this instance is come back in with some fresh carbon and put over that leachate area. If you distribute the carcasses equally, you shouldn't see this. And this was, man, this was a train wreck. Um, someone thought they knew how to compost, uh, and, they, and they didn't, and they drove up on top of the pile. The pile is compressed, and now we just got a mess because we don't get proper airflow through this. We had too many carcasses in one area, um, so we had to come in and try to fix this. And uh, Anyway, this just shows you if you don't do it properly, you can have a mess. Definitely never, ever, ever drive on a pile. Don't overlook those mortality compost bins. Uh, all right, two minutes. They may have contaminated carcass, as you can see in the left side. Um, so you got to get the things mixed. I go out there, mix them up, and then cap them. All right, this is the last bit, I believe. Um, don't be afraid to think outside of the box or the bag. In this case, we were able to bring in compressed bag shavings on pallets, equally distribute them throughout the house. And that saved us time from having to bring in bulk material one bucket load at a time. And you can actually bring in a lot more compressed material than you can bulk material. Uh, what that means, that means less traffic on and off that farm, less trucks to wash down. So I like that aspect of it. You are going to have to have a team that's going to cut these things open and kick them around and distribute them but that worked well. 
we did this in about an hour to an hour and a half per house, whereas uh, the traditional methods I've used before with uh, skid loaders would take five to eight hours to do this, to fill, to actually build a windrow. And we could do the base in an hour and a half. We could do the capping in about another hour. So save, bottom line, we just saved a tremendous amount of time, saved a lot of money uh, doing this method too. And you can see that the, the uh, laborers are kicking around the uh, carbon material making the base. Uh, then they're leveling the base with a cattle panel. I don't know if this is absolutely necessary, but it does get at least a nice even distribution throughout it. And there's our constructed base. That's the most level one I've ever seen. We take that material, pile on top of it. Um, then you can see we added more carbon material around it. Once we add that carbon material, we brought it in skid steers. You can see our final product here has some hills and valleys in it, and that's normal. You're going to see that. So we, we started thinking, and our team came up with this approach of uh, can we use a snowblower to speed up this process and make it more efficient. So this is our proof of concept. Uh, you also get weird looks in April when you go to rent a snowblower for people. They're uh, asking you if you know something about the weather that they don't. So here's our proof of concept. Yes, we can use a snowblower to shoot shavings. All right, let's bring in the big guns. So we have one on a uh, front end loader, on a skid steer. And here we're actually, we have our carbon material laid out. We get a much faster application. We can do this in about an hour. Uh, these are four to 500 foot houses, I believe. And uh, you get a uh, fast, even application. I like using this process. This is our final windrow. Notice how it actually looks more like a Twinkie. We got nice, good application. It starts heating up. Uh, we're at about 140 degrees here. Day 28, this is what I want to see. Dark humus-like material, no feathers. I'm not really seeing bones, tissue. It's all broken down. And then lastly, um, if you can limit traffic by putting up road close signs, it helps with media, animal rights groups. We had some of those issues in uh, Iowa, nosy neighbors, et cetera. And this is the last of my presentation. Biosecurity, biosecurity, biosecurity. Um, producers were a bit of a challenge on this. We all have to adhere to, to biosecurity. And worker safety, we're building up a lot of ammonia in these houses, so you have to ventilate them properly before you open them up. Uh, make sure you got your workers taken care of from fruit potties, food, on-site on shelters and hotels. Thoughts for improvement? All right, this is last. Um, I, I'd like for us all to think about other ways to euthanize the birds that doesn't crowd them to one end. And perhaps this is euthanizing them in the center of the house so that we can access it from both sides. Having them all at one end makes it very, very challenging for the guys that have to go in there and form these windrows. And um, I think we ought to get that equipment out of the house, um, either during euthanasia, after euthanasia. Uh, it just gets in our way and it gets damaged. I recommend two skid loaders per house on, on any future event because my goal I want to get in and get out of there as fast as possible. I don't want this to turn into a 10-day process, especially in warmer climates where you might attract flies. So two loaders per house, get in, in and out in a few days. Choosing the labor um, carefully. I've seen it work well with producers. I've seen it work well with contractors. It worked really well with USDA staff that we, that we trained to build these things uh, in, in Missouri. And again, as fast as possible so you don't get into issues. Um, preach biosecurity to the producers, not just from a holistic farm approach, but from a house-to-house -house approach. You might start looking at things like Danish entry systems where you walk in in your dirty clothes, go into your clean zone and wear overalls and then come back out, put on your street clothes. At the very least, I'd like to see some system where you walk in, you take your shoes off, 
you flip around on a bench and you put on rubber boots and those rubber boots never leave the house. So with that, um, I would be happy to answer any questions that you have. Actually, I just got back from Orlando, Florida at the National Turkey Federation and uh, took some images of uh, recent avian influenza impacts down there.